welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Ton La Jr. He's a medical student and recent law school graduate. And he wrote the Kevin MD article, Physician Suicide, We Need Safe Spaces to Talk About It. Ton, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, Dr. Poe. Great. Thanks for having me. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? No, definitely. So I'm based in Houston, Texas, um, hot Houston, <laughs> and I'm a fourth year medical student at Baylor College of Medicine. I recently graduated last December from uh, University of Houston Law Center, and I'm applying for uh, physical medicine rehab residency this fall with hopes of um, staying in town and I love writing. I've written for uh, Kevin MD for a few years now. Just like to advocate for issues rarely talked about in the open setting, such as uh, physician suicide, mental health, opioid crisis, COVID-19 especially, and just everyday experiences a medical student has, because I feel like that's a realm that before medical school, I wish I heard these stories because it gives you more insight of what the experience is like. And hopefully, um, just sharing my experience helps other incoming medical students and current med students. So I don't talk to very many medical students who are also law school graduates. Now, can you tell me a little bit about that journey into law school and why you decided to take that path? Yeah, sure. So I initially got interested in the law around the time um, Obamacare, the ACA came around. It was about sophomore year of college. And uh, I thought, why not? I took my MCAT, did pretty well. I have some time to take my LSAT, explore the, explore the space, and I did pretty, pretty okay. I got accepted to uh, University of Houston Law Center. They had a combined program with my medical school, and uh, they, took me, they took me in with open arms and the incredible experience. I have so many great classmates to, to thank for the journey. I had taken so many different health law courses, including disability in the law, uh, genetics, bioethics, healthcare industry, Medicare, Medicaid law, HIPAA. So uh, I'm really grateful for the experience because now I hope to down the road perhaps teach what I know, especially in the health law realm to uh, future medical students as a professor and possibly teach residents too. Because I think there is a lot of intersection between the two. Because you think both of them are different, but both fields aim to help people. Uh, medicine is, of course, through diagnosing management and acute and long-term care. But the law side, you actually help um, people with their uh, acute problems too. Sometimes they have something they need to take care of, whether that's um, finances or a lawsuit that's pending, or they just want legal advice um, for their own personal lives to make their lives better. So um, hopefully I get to help people in both, uh, both ways down the road. Wonderful. And best wishes on your continuing medical education journey. Thank you. So let's talk about that Kevin MD article that you wrote, and it's titled Physician Suicide. We need safe spaces to talk about it. Now, for those who didn't read the article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Oh, definitely. So I was part of the American Medical Student Association, and about, about two, two to three years ago, there was um, the annual conference where medical students from all across the country, pre-med students, and um, family members come to just explore what it's like to be a medical student and steps afterwards. And there was this documentary called Do No Harm. We were actually the very first showing of it. It's all about the increasing rate of physician and med student suicides across the nation and something that's rarely talked about. Sometimes it's published in media, but then you know, as news go, once it's out there, it fizzles away and there isn't sustained conversation about it. So um, after watching a documentary, uh, it was a very profound experience. I remember afterwards, probably 50, 60 med students got in line um, at each microphone just to say thanks to the producers, to talk about their experiences. And one by one, every student just talked about medical school and like how tough it is from having a family member diagnosed with cancer and having to balance your life with that through finding feelings of anxiety, depression, and other students even sharing their own attempts at suicide. And it was very, um, very eye-opening and it was, very, it was very provocative. And 
after a few students shared their stories, I decided to walk up to the line and share mine. Pro I would say definitely one of the hardest things for me to do is me personally, very, I like to keep those things to myself. But when I walked in line and I waited and I, I thought to myself, should I, should I do this? I'm still a medical student. What if someone in the audience is from my med school? What if they hear me sharing my honest feelings? But I told myself this is something I've kept in for so long. I really felt compelled to, sh to share. So after I walked to, the, walked to the mic, grabbed it, and started talking, I, I felt like my soul opened up. I just, I just talked about just, just how just how tough not just the information overload which i'm it's not some it's not something i'm necessarily um complaining about it's more so just having so much information given to you and not at times having that support that you would expect from your peers and and just overall uh like for me personally i i it was a very tough time for me uh i've had family members diagnosed with um pretty severe conditions thinking about finances as well, um, not passing, um, or maybe I'll just say it, all right, just failing a few exams, shelf exams, school exams, and, and sometimes people ask me, do you really want to do medicine? Uh, it hurt me a lot, um, especially to, to know that I, I, I didn't have the support that I would have liked. So afterwards, I, I just, I started crying. <laughs> I don't like doing that, but it's just, it was just a natural reaction. I just felt like I finally got to tell, tell my story. And a lot of students came up to me afterwards and they said, thank you for sharing. It's something we experienced too. And, and then that opened up to the overall conversation of um, there were families of suicide survivors in the audience. Um, one of them being Dr. Boyce Fish, dear friend of mine. Uh, he, Dr. Pamela Weibel wrote an article um, with him, with the store center around him, but he was anonymous back then. Uh, but recently talking with him about, you know, I've, I wanted to put my story, our story out there about what happened that night. And he said, go ahead, put my name out there if, um, if, it's, if it helps with the conversation. So I, I did. I spoke with him and his lovely wife, uh, Mrs. Fish, and also spoke with Rachel Dawson, who's the wife of um, Dr. Dawson, who was... Uh, mm -hmm who was a resident and he took his own life and the life of his two kids and she shared her story. And, and there were other families too that stayed in the late hours into the night. Um, and we just all talked, we just talked about our experiences and what needs to be done in medical education from the medical school level residency fellowship. And even as a attending physician, because um, if you read Dr. Fish's story in Kevin MD, he was a, he was a attending physician ER. But what spiraled him into his suicide attempt was uh, he had uh, a young girl who um, had influenza and um, he thought everything was okay with her. So he was, she was discharged, but she came back with respiratory failure and she ended up pass, passing away and that, that cut deep for um, boys. So, so I just, I, I think overall, uh, I think what I wanted to get through from the art through the article is that suicide, even to, even now, and I think for a very long time is a stigmatized topic. It's something mm -hmm. no one, it, it, it's something it's, it's hard to talk about because if you want to talk about it, you know, you can say your condolences, like, I'm sorry this happened, but like what positivity, what, what, per, how can we per, be productive through this conversation? And more so, can we keep this conversation going? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be more suicides happening for this conversation to keep going. That's not right. That's not the correct way or even the fair way to go about it. I think this is something that affects medical students, hundreds, thousands across the country, even internationally. And my sense is that although we can never really truly understand what drives a person to attempt suicide um, or just understanding the underlying factors, I, I, I'm a firm believer that if you don't have the support in medical school, it sort of um, puts the seeds in for um, chronic stress, fatigue, exhaustion, feelings of inadequacy, even depression, going to residency. And, and if, you, if, if you're not fortunate to go to a residency program that supports mental health and truly advocates for its trainees, it's dangerous. You can go on to fellowship if you choose to go that route, and then you become an attending. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, 
you have to think of, you have to think to yourself, once you're at that point where you have full autonomy to care for patients, who's caring for you? Because it might have been years, maybe a decade plus of not having that support that you needed. And now you're key now patients' lives are in your hands, literally. So I, I hope to, I hope my piece contributed to the conversation, especially as a med student, um, putting um, at least part of my story out there so that other students feel comfortable at least sharing either in public or private spaces with their deans, their family members, friends, um, because this is a serious issue and it, it, it shouldn't be more suicides to happen for the conversation to keep going because it's not, it, it's just not the right thing to do. So you said that you weren't comfortable sharing your story until this mm -hmm. documentary. Now, mm -hmm. what are some specific things that need to be put in place during medical education so mm -hmm. more medical students can share their stories before it's too late? Oh, that's, that, that's a great, um, something I've thought about recently too. There is something called story slams. I think uh, several medical student, medical schools have put this into place. It's where you can submit anonymously like a pitch of your story and then in an open forum where you're with other medical students, residents, even attendings, each person goes up to the mic and just talks. It's a safe space where you can just openly and freely put your feelings, thoughts, and ideas out there. And just, and just so others can hear, um, can hear what you have to say. I, I, th I think there's not enough of that. I think for me personally, I love to write because that's, that's, a, that's, that's one of my ways to express how I'm feeling and my opinions on things. But um, it's, it's important for schools to realize that there needs to be more avenues for students to express how they're feeling. Story slams is one idea. Another idea uh, I thought of are uh, learning communities. I think this was um, definitely explored at different medical schools. Uh, there was actually a study recently, uh, I think it was, a, it was the St. Louis University School of Medicine, and it was a longitudinal study, and they wanted to combat the rates of depression, anxiety reported by their medical students. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was, if I, I may get this wrong, but it may have been a six to 10 year study to where they did many changes. They cut the curriculum hours, they, they instituted learning communities where you have physician, being mentors to a small group of students and, and also just having that time with deans to talk about uh, issues you're having with family, personal life, school, and also to have multiple checkpoints during the cl pre-clinical or clinical years to just check in with students, just see how are you doing? Is there something you would like to talk about, anything that's on your mind? And uh, remarkably, uh, the rates of depression, anxiety, dropped like significantly. I believe depression dropped around 80% uh, throughout, the, throughout the study for first year students and then anxiety dropped about 75%. So it works. It, it, it's just a matter of schools knowing right off the bat that once you're a medical student, you will, you will encounter feelings of um, self-doubt. Mm -hmm. If you don't pass something, you have to have the stress of, oh, okay, I, I have one more chance to pass the exam or I, I, might, I might not advance in my uh, medical school career. Uh, just, just those things that uh, I'm hoping more and more schools, and I, I believe it's happening. I, I, I'm just hoping one day, mo majority of schools in the US have those um, safe spaces for students to, to vent. Uh, I just for one, one easy way to put it, just to, say what they feel, get the help they need in terms of therapy or just talking. Because I, I, I'm a firm believer too that talk is one of the best forms of therapy. Um, and sometimes as med students, we don't talk enough because we like to hold things in because we feel like we can take care of things for ourselves. But when things become too much mm -hmm. from external factors, school, family, finances, um, personal life, feelings of, of not feeling being fulfilled, especially with the rigors of med school. Um, just having those support systems in place, I think it will help med students across the country. Uh, it's a slow process for sure, but I think once more schools publish what they're doing in journals such as academic medicine mm -hmm. um, on PubMed and the other schools see what they're doing and they can probably model off of what's successful, I think we can definitely take uh, positive steps forward into reducing the rates of 
uh, med student suicide. And probably one, of, one other thing I wanted to point out is the literature of med student suicide is it's lacking, mm -hmm. um, which is not surprising because when it happens, you, you, you'll hear about it, but fools themselves don't want to put it out there because uh, understandably too, because it might discourage people from applying to the school, but it's also important to know that if you don't acknowledge it happen, it affects the current cohort of students knowing that the, the administration is not being forthright with what happened. So I think it's just transparency, schools emphasizing it's okay to be vulnerable, um, having vulnerability actually part of the curriculum, um, writing, talking, all those, all those ways are, are, are ways to tackle med student suicide and, and even beyond that physician mm -hmm. suicide. We're talking to Ton La Jr. He's a medical student and recent law school graduate, and he wrote the Kevin MD article, Physician Suicide, We Need Safe Spaces to Talk About It. Ton, there has been some changes in medical education that helps address medical school burnout. For instance, USMLE Step 1 is now pass-fail, and more and more clinical rotations are now pass-fail, perhaps trying to take that pressure of, of grades off medical students. Now, do those factors help or does more need to be done? It definitely helps. I, I believe part of the uh, St. Louis University of S uh, School of Medicine, they, they transition to pass fail. It definitely helps um, because it takes the pressure off, you know, getting A, B, C, what have you. But I, I think something that's unknown to pre-med students, because even if you are pass fail system, you still are, you still are ranked. So if, if you're gearing for like those really competitive residencies like surgery, uh, radiology, dermatology, plastic surgery, you're still ranked. And that's based on your preclinical grades. Although it's pass fail, the school internally ranks you. They just never release it to you. Mm. Um, so when you enter that MS3, MS4 year and you find out you didn't make AOA or, um, or AOA or, stuff, or get other honors, it's, it's because you were ranked uh, from the beginning. It's just it wasn't told to you. So I think that's another way, of, another thing of there's not enough transparency. Um, so pass feels great. Um, it's sort of a bandage to, okay, I'm not, I, I, I'm not being compared with my peers at the moment, but actually you are. So definitely more, definitely more needs to be done. And as far as step one uh, being pass, I think that's great. It's, <laughs> it's a tough exam uh, for sure, but because step one's pass fail, especially for this transition into, you know, students applying with their uh, step one, whether to take, you know, take the score or not. And then, but more emphasis actually now placed on step two. And I've actually spoke with a lot of uh, doctors and, and current students about this. They feel even more pressure to do even better on step two. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and right now we're sort of in a flux, like how will residency, was residency programs take that? Will they, will they consider more school prestige into their rankings of students or, or even giving offering interviews? How much of an emphasis will they put on step two? So I think when it comes to board exams, there's always going to be stress with it, even if you make it pass fail. And even recently they, they took off um, step two CS. Mm -hmm. um, that's no longer in play, which is great. That takes a lot of stress off, but I think board exams are here to stay. It's a reason we have them. It's a way to, if you, if you want to gear for certain specialties, it's a way to know where you're at and to work towards a goal of a score. I think that's healthy. It's okay. But I think more needs to be done from med, from the medical schools themselves, just supporting support from the get-go, from orientation. Deans need to be open to having those tough conversations with students and not pushing students aside and, and just having safe spaces, um, like I said before. So I think there's a lot more... Um, room to go for schools to to give that support to students, but I, I believe we're definitely in the right direction. Like for my med school, for example, uh, it's phenomenal. We have learning communities, we have peer resource network, we have uh, specialty mentors, um, individual for each student, uh, depending on what you want to go into. So I would say my med school is a great example of a model for mental health support for students. Um, it's just a matter of can other schools do that also for their own. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Yeah, so I, I know it's, it's a very wide, wide ranging audience. I, I think uh, I have probably two take home points. One is 
physician suicide um, and also suicide amongst med students, it's unfortunately going to continue to happen. It's, it's become unfortunately a part of, it's become a norm, uh, just to put, put it plainly. But with that said, uh, I think regardless of whether you're, um, you know, uh, if you're in med school or not in med school, if you know anyone in um, medicine or even just healthcare in general, is suicide doesn't just affect us, it affects mm -hmm. EMTs, RTs, anyone who's treated COVID-19 patients. It, it's, a, it's a serious situation. So if you know anyone, reach out to them. It doesn't, you don't need to have a reason for it. It's just reach out to them. It's asking, can, can you meet up for lunch, breakfast, have a phone call? zoom call what have you just just reach out and just truly truly put yourself there for that person you're reaching out to i think this is truly a grassroots uh, movement honestly just just everyone from the entire entire society just understanding that this is a thing that's going to continue to happening it's up to us to support those that the the people that care for us because if if we can't if we don't do enough for them and this keeps happening thousands hundreds to thousands of of medical trainees to physicians will keep dying for suicide every year. And it's just not, it's not something that sits right with me. I don't think it right, sits right with anyone. We need more than just writing articles and, and um, like what I'm doing, but we just need to have a productive conversation moving forward and for uh, med schools and residency programs. And even afterwards, just showing that support to those that, invest their own time into learning medicine and mm -hmm. to treating patients. Ron, thank you so much for sharing your insight and time. And thanks again for being on the show. Thanks, Dr. Poe. I appreciate it.